Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topic. We have on Dr. Vonda Wright, who is a double board certified orthopedic surgeon, researcher, and team doctor who's focused on optimizing personal and professional performance at any age. So Bridget and I were just talking about the fact that we really haven't had an orthopedic surgeon on the show before. So welcome to the show, Dr. Wright. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. And, you know, we really are fascinated by all the research and changes that are happening in the aging process. And one of the topics that we thought was important to talk about, obviously, is bone health, because as someone who has osteoporosis, I'm always Mm -hmm. concerned about fractures. So can you talk a little bit about bone health as we start to age? Well, you know, uh, aging bone health has less to do with our absolute age with, but has to do with how we prepared ourselves as younger women. So I know we're, we're talking about hot flashes and cool things, but wouldn't it be a cool thing if all of our daughters would hear us talking about the fact that you have until you're 30 to lay down bone. And so whether you have a day job that sits in a in a desk all day or whether you're a, got a very active job bashing your bones meaning jumping up and down 20 times a day which ladies is all it really takes to stimulate some of some parts of bone health or uh amazing nutrition which includes whole foods with lots of protein at least a gram per uh, pound a day which we can talk about why i say things like that and uh, whole foods that get you enough vitamin D or magnesium, potassium are all critical for preparing ourselves in our 30s, 20s, 30s, for what's going to happen in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. And so bone health does, does not come upon us when we're perimenopausal and we're having all the hot flashing. It is actually a lifelong pursuit because bones are the structure of us, right? So what happens when we fracture. Well, most of us don't even know we're osteopenic until we fracture. Osteoporosis is a silent disease until it screams at you when you break something. And it can be something big, like we fall uh, down from a height and we break our hip or we break our, our distal radius, the end of our arm as it attaches to our hand. Or many women as they age, will fall from a standing position. They're minding your, their own business in the kitchen and they break and then they fall. And so, you know, what happens when women break like that? Let's talk about hip fracture. And so uh, your audience can't see it, but I, I have this sawbones hip in my office that I often play with. And a hip fracture is a devastating life-changing event, no matter what age you are. I've had 28-year-olds with osteopenia get it. I've had 50-year-olds with osteopenia, and I've had the more typical 70-year-olds. 50% of us do not return to pre-fall function. And if you're elderly with a hip fracture, 30% of you will die in the first year. So I'm not kidding as your orthopedic surgeon when I say that along with the hot flashes, the brain fog, the the everything else that we commonly associate with perimenopause and menopause, many of which that will go away in our 50, as we're 55 and 60 years old, our bone health and our lean muscle mass problems will not go away by themselves. So I am a big, big advocate of number one, getting women to understand that, uh, our bones are our livelihood. Without strong bones, we're frail, which has its own line of complications. Um, and that there's stuff we can do about it no matter what age. And so, so A, being aware is number one, right? If your mother is shrinking, no matter what age you are, my mother used to be as tall as me. I'm 5'4". Now my mother comes up to here. Well, shrinking is a sign that your vertebral bones are getting uh, smaller and smaller. So if you see in your family, women are shrinking, women are men are shrinking, or you've had a fracture, the number one uh, predictor of future fracture is past fracture, or you smoke, have diabetes type two, have a known family history of, of people falling and breaking their hips. If you're a teeny tiny person or a fair person, those are all risk factors for silent osteopenia, osteoporosis. So A, that's awareness. B, I am not of the school that says you have to wait until you're 65 to get your DEXA scan. Now, those are the national recommendations. That's what your insurance will pay for. But what I am advocating is that people save up their $250, which is what a DEXA scan 
costs, some much cheaper in this country, and just go get one yourself, right? So this morning I went to Starbucks and oh my gosh, I can't imagine. It cost me $10 for this stupid fancy drink, right? If I just didn't do that, which I don't, because that, that was an insult to me. But if we just don't do that a few times, we can pay for our DEXA scan, which can seriously save our lives. So number one is education. Number two, do not take no for an answer when it comes to your bone health. Seek out to know what your baseline is, no matter what your age is. I would like every 40-year-old woman as part of her adulting to get a DEXA scan, because at least you know where you are before what happens around perimenopause. We can lose 20% of our bone density in perimenopause, menopause, and the five years after menopause. In that 10-year time, we can lose 20%. So... Number two. Number three, what happens if we're already osteopenic? What happens if we want to prevent becoming that way? Well, bashing your bones still applies unless you're really frail. So literally the research says jumping up and down 20 times a day. I often give, I, I work with women both orthopedically and as private clients, I give them all a jump rope if you want to be fancy with your jumping. Otherwise, you can stand at your sink in the morning when you're practicing your balance by standing on one foot and just jump up and down 20 times. That stimulates the electrical pathways that, because our bones use, use minerals, which carry a charge, uh, and it helps lay down new bone. So jumping. Number two, build lean muscle mass. I am a huge proponent of lifting as heavy as we can at this age. So if you're going to start lifting and have never, ever lifted, you can grab one of my books that'll tell you how to do it, or you can grab a trainer because it's not for matters. But once we learn how to lift properly so we don't get hurt, I like women to put down the mamby-pamby pink weights, which do us no good, and lift as heavy as we can. So if you come to my office, which is in this amazing performance uh, center, you will find me doing powerlifting. Yes, last night I was doing, uh, I, it was the night for back squats. I was doing back rows with free weights, just as heavy as I can. Few reps, four to six reps for four sets. Because what are we trying to do at our age? Unless you are a distance endurance runner and need endurance, what we are trying to do is build power. We need to be able to get up from the ground. We need to be able to lift things over our head. That takes power, not endurance, right? Also, lifting heavy regenerates our stem cells and our muscles. They're called satellite cells, which then help us build more lean muscle mass, which is the whole point, because building lean muscle mass will then pull on the bones, muscles are all attached to bones, and stimulate bone health. So we have education, building better bones, and then we have building lean muscle mass, which in itself is a longevity factor. So uh, these are critical things that if we don't do something about it, the minute we discover we're perimenopausal and we're not sleeping, our brains are foggy and we're having hot flashes, it may be too late because the musculoskeletal effects of low estradiol can be permanent and devastating, right? But if we get in front of it and have the knowledge base, there's things we can do about it. So when you're talking about, that's the first I've heard, which is great to do as heavy as you can, because we've all heard repetitions lightweight, because a lot of women think they're going to look like a bodybuilder. Okay, let me, just talk, yeah, yeah. let me just talk to that. Lifting light weights will never make you look like a bodybuilder, number one. <laughs> number two, without estrogen, it takes even more work. And so there is a group of women, I just watch what they do all the time. They're called the Wonder Women. It takes years of heavy lifting to even get definition. So if we could please put out of our minds that we're gonna look like a bodybuilder, because most of us just need to, to uh, trade fat for muscle, right? Fat is a noxious metabolic organ. It's just not hanging around in inconvenient real estate, right? It is noxious. It it releases adipokines, which is fat chemicals, 
which affect everything in our body, whether it's insulin resistance, whether it's our muscle function. So uh, ladies, please, you are not going to become Hulk Hogan by lifting heavy. Um, with, with the jumping, and I think I was talking to you earlier, all of a sudden my knee started doing sure. dumb things to me. Yeah. Um, can that, would I be okay still? Like even if that kind of thing, when you have an injury or something, is there anything else you could suggest? Well, let's talk about musculoskeletal pain and menopause. It's another thing that is not widely, widely talked about, but every musculoskeletal tissue, whether it's tendon, cartilage, which we're talking about in your knee, and I will directly address your question, um, muscle, have both alpha and beta receptors for estrogen. Their little receptors on cells are little baskets. The estrogen comes in and fills the basket, which causes the tissue the basket sitting on, the receptor it's sitting on, to do its function. Without estrogen filling the estrogen baskets on your cartilage, the cartilage becomes less structurally sound and can be painful. So 80% of women, 80% of women in perimenopause and menopause will have increased musculoskeletal pain. You're wondering, why am I sore all the time? Why is that? Well, that's because your estrogen receptors are uncovered and your tissues are unprotected. So that's number one. 20% of women have such severe musculoskeletal pain that they cannot do their activities of daily living. So you're not falling apart and you're not going crazy. This is real. So what do we do about, now you told us you have a meniscus tear. And so, but you decided not to have, you did therapy, which is amazing, right? You got right. strong, you built some- My, my doctor, up. one doctor said they wanted to do surgery. And then when I had the MRI, that doctor said, no, no surgery. So- yeah. Well, you know, here's when you decide to have surgery. You decide to have surgery when your sharp stabbing, popping, clicking, catching is getting in the way. If it's just a deep aching, well, then what do we do about deep aching? We um, consider what our hormones are doing and whether we're going to augment those. And that's a choice that we can talk about uh, and how I recommend women get information about that. Number two, we build lean muscle mass, as you did in therapy. Um if jumping up and down hurts, we have a bigger problem than we think we have, right? We we really need to address it. And there are ways to feed your cartilage besides hormones that will allow you to continue to be active because here's the death sentence. And I say this to orthopedics at surgeons all the time. I'm about to give grand rounds at Mount Sinai in New York. I'm going to say this to every all of them. If you say to somebody as a physician, oh, just stop it if it hurts or why don't you just grow up and act your age and just, you are sentencing them to sedentary death syndrome because nothing will kill you in a worse way, except lightning maybe, than telling somebody just to sit still. You are sentencing them to a long, slow death between health span and lifespan. And so uh, we have to do better and find ways for you to be able to play tennis again. Um, by building lean muscle mass, by feeding your cartilage, by by understanding how augmenting either with estrogen or with estrogen-like substances to make your musculoskeletal tissue better. And there I are, am on, oh, I'm sorry. I'm on an estro, estrogen patch and I, was, yeah. I have been for a yeah, while. Yeah. So, yeah. There are a lot of women in our demographic, like you said, that suffer aches and pains every day. They get up, their muscles are tight. They're, they, they're afraid to jump. They're afraid to do any type of plyometric training. What do you say to those women to get them kind of out of that mindset that I am going to injure myself if I try to jump from the floor to that three foot box? Well, uh, A, I'd examine where that mindset comes from. Where did that fear of mobility come from? And I want to return to that. Where did that fear of mobility come from? Number one. Number two, have they been hurt before? I mean, maybe they've had a terrible injury and there is that fear, even in young athletes, that you're going to do it again. But if you're afraid to jump from the ground to three feet, there are a variety of plyo boxes. And first, we can step you up onto a 12-inch box, 
right? Everybody can step up 12 inches because an average step in your house is eight inches. So once you feel comfortable up and down on the 12, then I'm going to ask you to jump up into the 12. And when you're like, this is so easy, I'm not a child, right? We may increase it to 18, but plyometrics are critical um, for women who don't have frank osteoporosis minus 2.5 or uh, standard deviations on our T-score um, because it does so many things. It stimulates muscle. It stimulates stem cell um, uh, growth. So, but to your point, I think we can, can o overcome fear by progressive overload and not thinking the first jump is 36. For instance, uh, when I started plyo jumping, I had that fear. I still, I talked to my husband about it last night. My husband was spotting me in the gym last night and I am plyo bo boxing 24 now. I started at 20. Now I moved up to 24, but I still do. I get it. I have that fear that I'm going to trip and my toe's going to catch and I'm going to fall forward. And you know what he said to me? Yes, real fear. But what happens if you fall forward? You fall forward onto a cushioned box, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's basically a hard pillow. So I get it, but we start slow and we progressively overload uh, after looking at why we're fearful in the first place. Sometimes fear is just the unknown. And and it could be what was told to you, you know, in the past, uh, sure. like how you grew up, people telling you not, I mean, so many old wives tales about, you know, back, way back, you couldn't even swim if you were told you not to swim, if you were having your cycle. It, so it, it is, you know, just kind of ingrained in things like that. I hear you. I yeah, hear you. yeah. We live in a new time. It's time yeah. to, you know, thank God you guys are here with hot flashes and cool topics. To <laughs> thank the you. Old wives tales. <laughs> yes. How, um, how often should women be strength training or doing plyometrics or should it be a compliment twice a week? And then you also do, you know, maybe the elliptical and yoga and, or should you try to train more than twice a week? Well, you need both, right? You need, uh, now let's, you need both women in the demographic you're speaking to. If you could do one thing, if you're like, I am too busy, I've got my six kids, which whatever, we cannot get to it. One thing, and that is lifting heavy right? If you can still do other things, then uh, we suggest zone two aerobics. People think you have to go out and kill yourself every single day with high intensity interval training. Actually, no. The best way to be metabolically healthy, to uh, manage your glucose spikes, to uh, build uh, overall health is zone two, which is very low heart rate. Uh, and the good thing is it it's most efficient for metabolizing fat. So it uses fat as energy without producing acid, the lactic acid that makes us sore. So zone two for women in their fifties, if you can't come and get your lactate threshold measured, which is we are happy to do that for you, you can take can take a rough estimate it's 220 minus your age and take about 70 percent of that max so for me my zone two because i have been a lifelong high intensity interval person like that's where i got my dopamine when you do that every day you're going to end up hurt you're going to end up in the orthopedic surgeon's office and you're going to be overtrained. you're going to be exhausted probably under fueled zone two three hours a week broken up in 45 to 60 minute sessions. So for me, my zone two is 125 beats per minute. Uh, I get that outside by um, brisk walking and intermittent jogging to keep my heart rate up. I get it on a treadmill with the treadmill set at 3.9 at an elevation of three. And that's progressive. It You know, that the, the what you have to do to keep your heart rate in that will will change as you get in better shape. But it's not high intensity interval training. Then, so so three hours a week. Now, what I do do twice a week is I sprint my guts out at the end of a zone two. You never do it cold. I, you know, at the end of a zone two, I have a little sweat going. I feel like I've done some great metabolic work. And then 
twice a week, I turn the treadmill up. I'm right now I'm on 11.5 for 30 seconds because sprinting has its own batch of amazing metabolic functions, but everybody's sprint is different. If you're just stepping away from the couch for the first time, your sprint on a treadmill may be a four and your zone two may be a two and that's okay. You're not in competition with anybody. It's your personal journey. So I'm just giving you my numbers as an example of, so I've been doing this a while. And so this is what I'm doing. Um, the sprints twice a week, you do 30 seconds and then you recover for two or three minutes. And then you only do three to four sessions. So aerobic for women in our demographic, zone two, three hours a week, broken up into 45 to 60 minute sessions. And then if you want, if you want to sprint, which is amazing for us, do it twice a week after the zone two. So that's that's how aerobics works most effectively for our metabolism. But if you only get to choose one in your life, you do lean muscle mass building. Now, what if you're on your kid's soccer field 12 hours a week or three hours a week? You know, nobody says you have to sit there in the stands or your lawn chair or in the car scrolling for the whole practice, nobody says you can't walk around the soccer field. You'll still get to see your kid play. Now they may be embarrassed about it, but listen, time is time. You can take care of yourself while participating in your kids' lives. So I'd love to see more of that out there. Absolutely. And, you know, with the sprinting, how you say that, is that the HIIT workouts, you know, that were so popular? What are your thoughts on the HIIT workouts? I don't mind HIIT workouts. Uh, you know, a couple times a week, but what I see, and, and I'm not going to name brand names, but what I see is when you hit workout six days a week, I'm not really kidding. You do not become metabolically more healthy. You're unlikely to lose weight if that's what people want to do. Um, and people are often injured. And then what happens? Because you're not, you don't have any recovery time. We are midlife people. We need recovery time. Even, even 20 year olds need recovery time, just less of it. So what I see is the six day a week, high intensity interval people, they'll be fine for a while, six weeks or so. They're starting to have aches and pains. They're starting to have overuse injuries. They feel their, their overall energy dropping because they're under fueled and, and under recovered. And then they have to come see somebody like me an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and then that's annoying, right? I'm sorry, you're not doing what you want. You have to sit in the doctor's office. And then because you can't do what you're normally doing and your brain's not getting the hit of dopamine that it's used to, then you just feel awful. And then you take time off and then you start back weaker. It's a cycle. So if we can be smarter, if we can harness the wisdom of our age and the actual science, nothing I've said to you today, I made up. This is all from my desk. If you could see my, I'm in my office, you could see my desk. It is covered with research papers about this stuff. So I've not made any of it up. It's all research-based. So another thing that you talked about in one of your books is about DNA renewing on a cellular level. And I thought, wow, that sounds really, that sounds fascinating because people at our age, give up sometimes. They think, oh, okay, I'm I'm too old to do anything about what's going on with my body. I've passed that bridge. Can you talk about that? Well, I'm going to talk about DNA, but I'm going to talk about that mindset. Yeah. Where did that mindset come from? That probably came from, again, you mentioned hearing it from the people, our grandmothers we were raised by, but let's think about their lives at that point. In the night, in the early 1900s, around the time of the First World War, right, 1914, or even the Second World War, 1944, the life expectancy for people in the United States was around 40. So, but that's for men. They didn't keep records of women, right? So we don't know where women live, maybe a few years longer, but the life expectancy was 40. And so, you know, I can understand why then at 40, people felt over the hill and why Hallmark has made a million and million and million every day on rest in peace balloons for 40 year olds. My research and the research of many other physiologists interested in, in 
in my particular thought uh, area of musculoskeletal aging show that we can be healthy, vital, active, joyful long into the foreseeable future if we make the changes and the investment in the things that change our DNA, which I will tell you um, daily. It is not unheard of to have people living into their 90s. Not unheard. I mean, everybody around me is living into their 90s, but our health span, the time in our lives before disease rears its ugly head is 62. So what are we doing between 62 and 81? Are we dying slowly because we've copped to the attitudes that we heard from our grandmothers that, oh, at a certain age, a light bulb goes off and our DNA is old and blah, blah, blah. Well, we can cop to that, but I don't, I don't know about you, but I want to die like Queen Elizabeth who's the most recent example of meeting the prime minister on Tuesday and just going to sleep Thursday and not waking up at, at 97. So how do we do that? Well, first, we don't cop to the attitude that we've heard. We decide I am my own person. I get to create my future the way I want it. I can say I'm going to live my grandmother's life or I am going to learn and do whatever I can from a lifestyle perspective, which will then change our DNA to live the life that I envision. But the first thing we have to do is stop looking back. Everybody wants to look back to when they were 18 or 25 or even 30. And oh my gosh, it was the best time in our lives. It was amazing. And maybe it was. But when I was in my 20s and 30s, I was still in school. I was not in control. I made no money. Right. I had my first child when I was 40. I had yet to to childbear. I mean, we think it's good because just like childbirth, we don't remember the pain. Right. We only remember what the pictures say we did. But listen, we can never go forward and be the best that we can be going forward by looking in the rearview mirror because we're going to run into something in the front. Right. So the first mindset change that we need to do to change our DNA and to be willing to invest the time to put in the work, because it's not magic, it's work, is to pivot our mindset and our bodies to face the future, right? So that's number one. We're going to face our future and be look forward to being healthy, vital, active, joyful. Number two, how do we change our DNA? Well, here's the thing. 70%, you've heard this many times before, 70 to 80% of our health and aging is predetermined by the lifestyle choices we make every day. There are 1,440 opportunities. That's how many minutes a day there are to make the choices that move us towards our best life, right? That's a lot of hopeful opportunity. We are nobody's victim. We can choose for the most part to take a walk every day, to walk around the soccer field, grab food that is beneficial to us. Now I want to address that. There, there is a real problem with food in this country. And there are many places where there's a food desert, which means the only place you can get food is a bodega on the corner. But I contend now that Amazon delivers food, even if you have a limited budget, you can still get foods that can help you. Like a bag of white Northern beans is so cheap. One bag of beans will expand in water to feed everybody, and it is high protein. Uh, it's really good for us. So I know there are lots of different situations, but I also think there are a lot of different answers. So anyway, back to 70% of our health and aging is due to our decisions. What about that 30% due to our DNA? Well, I am here to tell you that even your lifestyle decisions through the power of epigenetics, meaning when you eat broccoli instead of potato chips, the broccoli, because of all the amazing natural compounds, cause the DNA that you have to express in a different way. So you are, sometimes we can't do anything about the DNA we've inherited, but through our lifestyle choices, we can change how that DNA is transcribed, which is the process, the science process, transcribed into the proteins that can either make us healthy or make us unhealthy. Here's another example. In my lab at the University of Pittsburgh, where I was for 20 years, we were studying musculoskeletal aging. And so we had little old lady mice living in their cages. A little old lady mice are two years old. They've 
done all the great stuff they're going to do, and they're just hanging out waiting for their next meal. But we took those little old lady mice and we took little bitty samples of their thigh muscle and isolated their muscle stem cells, satellite cells. And when those little old lady mice were sitting around, their satellite cells were not dividing. They were not producing growth factors. They were going from plump, gorgeous, healthy stem cells to gnarly, spindly, looking like tree branches cells. And they had turned on the, pat the genetic pathways to program cell death. Death is an active process in our bodies. We don't just, our bodies turn on death pathways when we don't need things anymore. Sitting around is a signal to our body that we don't need things anymore. So these little old lady mice were, were on their way out. We took them and we had them on treadmills twice a day for two weeks. Now, little old lady mice do not like to move any more than the rest of us do. So they tried to sit in the corner, but we encouraged them, we coached them. And for two weeks, twice a day, we ran them on these little mouse treadmills. And do you know what happened to their stem cells, their satellite cells? It was the literal fountain of youth. They were fat and happy again, these stem cells. They were producing growth factors. They were no longer spindly, but they were like grapes. And my people, they had turned off the pathways towards cell death. Something as simple as exercising on a treadmill, no matter what your age will be, or some of the first studies in humans were done in 90-year-old people sitting on a chair, can completely change your body's perspective on where it is in life and change us at a cellular level. That is the most hopeful uh, message I think I can give you today. You are nobody's victim. You have the agency to choose and your body will respond. So your book, Fitness After 40, Your Strong Body at 40, 50, 60, and beyond, you talk about different ways in which we can do improve a lot of, of, of how we feel, not necessarily how we look, because Bridget and I aren't, aren't, aren't huge proponents on do this so you can fit in size whatever dress anymore. We don't Me care about either. that. Yep. Yeah. We're about do it to feel good. And yeah. for a lot of people, as we get older, balance becomes a big issue. What oh, can yeah. we be doing to improve our balance? Well, it does. And our balance starts to decline in our 20s, actually, because balance is due to the neuromuscular pathways between our brains and our muscles. It's due to eyesight. It's due to the little bones in our ear. And so not only all three of those things degrade with time, and especially we are all wearing glasses. I never wore glasses before I turned 45. And then I couldn't read long enough because my eyes were exhausted. So all of those things. So contribute to balance. So what can we do? Oh, here's the good thing. People, if you're not wearing glasses, could you just accept it and put some glasses on so you're not falling over? Uh, number two, um, this is so simple. I write about it in both uh, uh, Fitness After 40 and Guide to Thrive. And to retrain balance, all you have to do every single morning when you're brushing your teeth, when you have the safety of the sink to grab onto, stand on one leg and change legs every other day. Because the perturbation, I'm, I'm moving my arm back and forth like I'm using a toothbrush, will knock you off balance. But it, then what will you retrain your balance, right? And when you really get good at that with your eyes open, you can do it with your eyes closed because that is even better for training balance, right? So we need to be able to stand on one foot without falling over with our eyes closed for 22 seconds. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And it has to be retrained. Now, if you've aced this, if this is so simple for you, then you grab your BOSU ball and you start doing some of your uh, uh, work on an uneven surface or even... The step before a BOSU ball is one of those foam mats, right? It's it's just foamy and thick and you can stand on it and demands more balance. But it's as simple as that, but so critical because A, you don't want to get hurt by just falling over and spraining your ankle, but you definitely don't want to fall and break something because we've already talked about that. Yeah, there's all those tests that you see like on social media. If you stand, I think I saw the one where if you can stand on one leg, now it said 10 seconds then if you can't do that, 
it was like, you'll die in 10 years. It was, you know, I don't take all those, I know I don't take all those to heart, (laughs) but it was, you know, it got all these people were doing this kid. I stand on one leg, but 22 seconds, that's really something. Cause you know, that one was 10 and you know, it always seems like one leg you're it's stronger easier on one leg yeah. than the other leg but yeah so that that's very interesting but um I don't know if there's any truth to the die in 10 years thing <laughs> you know? Gosh, no, I buyer beware when it comes to the internet right sure right. yes yes <laughs> absolutely well we will make sure to have um links to your books in our show notes and links to your website and we really oh. appreciate your time today oh, thank, thank you, you so much Dr. Vonda Wright for joining us And we appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.